happen at any time. So let's uh, let's go, Jessica. It is absolutely fantastic to have you on this episode of Leadership Bites. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, very excited. And of course, I start every one of these off with I know who you are. So it'd be great just for the audience to get a very brief introduction as to who you are, Jessica. Yes, I am the chief scientist of workplace culture at Culture Partners, and we're a management consulting firm, basically. My job is to lead research and strategy around best practices in driving culture that gets results. So I get to partner with Stanford and do research around culture and strategy alignment. I get to work with our clients and understand what's been working in the interventions that we've done with them, digging into data, doing both quantitative and qualitative analysis to understand what what really moves people, how can culture be improved, and, and what is culture, and how do we get results with culture? So culture is... Uh well, it's one of those things that everybody's got an opinion on. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm, I'm always fascinated by, well, I've, I've worked in a company, so this is my expertise on it, through to I've been on a course, through to, you know, whatever it is. So it, it is one of those ones that I think everybody pricks up their ears when the word culture uh, comes into it. So I, I guess uh, we have a podcast, it's called Leadership Bite. So here's people that are interested in and, and, and understand the concept of leadership and culture. So maybe that's the first jumping off point if we talk about culture and how to activate it uh, and and what that means to you uh, that i think would be a great starting point for just getting your your thoughts and opinions yeah that's a great question because i'm talking to ceos all year long and when i ask ceos of fortune 500 companies i mean those that have theoretically made it what culture is i get tons of different answers. There is no generally agreed upon definition of culture. So I consider myself an evangelist in trying to narrow down the field when we talk about culture. Here's what culture is not. It's not ping pong tables in your lobby. It's not Hawaiian shirt Fridays. It's not happy hours. It's not team building. It's not all of those things that are like perks. The things that 20 years ago, Google published articles, did a whole PR press release about, look at how great our quote unquote culture is because we have volleyball on campus and people can bring their dog to work. That's not culture. The definition of culture that we use and that really drives results is culture is experiences that we share that shape our beliefs, what we believe to be true about each other and about the work we're doing. And those beliefs are what drive our actions and actions get results, as everyone knows. So when we talk about culture, we're talking about what we're getting as a result, as a result of our actions, as a result of the beliefs we hold, as a result of the experiences we share. So when you understand that definition, you can really activate culture and drive changes within an organization to get the key results that you're trying to achieve. So just so I can make sure I'm keeping up with your definition there, and I do like that culture is not, uh, in essence, I put the perks. I was watching a video clip of uh, during the last the, the tech layoffs that we're hearing a lot about, particularly in the UK. There was um, a lady that did, and I can't quite tell if it's a skit or it's a genuine one, but she was talked about being laid off. And she said, you know, you didn't adopt me, you hired me. And she was really sort of referencing the point of you're, you're talking about family and the six the six different types of tea in the cupboard, and all these kind of things. But actually, that's if I was family, then you wouldn't be treating me like this. So it's 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 that. So I'm, when you talked about ping pong tables, I would class that as the environment. Those are just environmental factors that you've created, and and I just want to make sure that that's. That's exactly what you're referencing. And when you talk about culture is shared experiences, it's almost then it is the narrative. It is the story, but it's the emotional response that I'm having about my sense of connection, care. Uh, have, I, have I understood that correctly? And if not, calibrate it to make it more accurate. Yes, I think the first half you were right on track and then we veered off course a little bit. So I saw the same post that you saw and I so support what she was saying because culture, I mean, organizations are not a family. 
And in fact, if you work for a company that says we're a family here, that's a red flag. I would run for the hills because my family doesn't keep me accountable to performance targets in my life. They love me unconditionally and they will support me and be there for me. And so that's not the nature of an organization. It's just not. And so to try and phone it in, so to speak, from a leadership perspective and say, we're family, we care about you. When the reality is, if the market warrants, we are going to have to lay you off off and let you go from the family, it really sends mixed messages and it can create a sense of betrayal in the employee that is very emotional. Um, where we veered off course, however, is culture is not about feelings. That's the key here. Culture is about how we think and act. Feelings are that emotional side. Feelings are what people are trying to solve for when they do things like put a ping pong table in the lobby and have a Hawaiian shirt Friday. They're trying to make people happy. And if you're trying to make people happy, you're probably going to throw really short-term solutions at what you think culture is. But we're trying to change the way people think and the way that they act. We're trying to change their beliefs and the actions that they take in a sustained way. So culture transformation is not about transforming feelings. It's about creating sustained behavioral change. And what most leaders do is they get stuck in something called the action trap. So here's the results we're getting, and now we need people to act differently. So they get stuck in the action trap trying to change action. Well, maybe we should implement a new process. Maybe we need a new technology. Maybe we need to do an org restructure. These are the typical things that leaders go to to create change and results, and they're all very action-focused. But culture is understanding that people's actions will change when that understanding has fallen from the head to the heart, and their belief changes, their values change. It's something about, I believe that this is important, and therefore I'm going to take new action. And we change beliefs by giving experiences. Typical experiences include the stories we tell on all hands calls. It can be the feedback we're giving on a one-on-one. -on -one. It can be recognition, either in a personal or a public way. Those are all experiences that will reinforce the beliefs you're trying to reinforce that will lead to new actions that will lead to results. It's, it's way beyond how people feel. So I understand that you can appeal to people's uh, in the moment happiness you know there's lattes available and there's ping pong tables <laughs> available so almost when I talk about feelings I have a sense that there's there's two levels of appeal if somebody says oh, I'm not happy I go well yeah but walking around constantly happy is a big ask for you know for life let alone the workplace but you could be content you could be connected you could feel valued you know and, and that doesn't mean that you've people agree with you but you could be respected, etc. So does feelings, and it may be a different word that we want to utilise, but I think there is a vernacular maybe where I come from that I just want to level up so people don't disregard what you're saying because the language may be, we might be discussing the same thing but just using different words, yeah. is not, not that kind of superficial, hey, ice cream Friday, you know, not, not that. Um, but when people have a sense of understanding the systems, having a sense of being valued, and, and, you know, etc. They have an emotional response to it, which is different to people um, appealing to people's emotions uh, at, at a kind of superficial level. D does that feel okay? Or is that still taking it away? As in those actions do lead to things that I can trust and I can believe in and they're that they have integrity and transparency and you're not trying to placate me with things that are in essence not really not really genuinely aimed at me but more almost like the visual signals yeah i think we're getting into semantics here i would call it beliefs but i think we're th believing the same thing right we're Great. talking the Great. same language even though we're using different words and so That's it's perfect. i believe that i can trust you i believe Fantastic. that i have psychological safety here i believe i am valued those are the beliefs we're trying to create and sure there may be an emotion attached to it um, but the emotion may be different depending on the person right so some people when they believe they're valued they feel a deep sense of contentment and safety and other people when they believe they're valued they feel a sense of entitlement like that as table stakes so the feeling may be different the belief can be the same we're trying to 
encourage leaders to think about the beliefs that their employees hold rather than feelings simply because it points them into a different direction in terms of the solutions they're implementing. Now, that's really powerful, actually. It's worth understanding that it's not that we don't understand that the word emotions got multiple layers, but in the general vernacular, if we just use the word emotions, then actually it takes us down a road that is actually probably a little bit more superficial than if we were able to work with the full meaning of it. But the moment we say it, it kind of triggers a whole set of connections and kind of maybe sets of what people start to think it means. So actually creating that differentiation may require an explanation, but you're doing it on purpose because you don't want to confuse the two and make what you're doing weaker by having that word associated to it, if I've understood that. Right, absolutely. And here's the other key to this model, just to hammer it home for those at okay. home. the res- It always is tied to the, the beliefs we're trying to encourage are- can directly be and should directly be tied to the results. So you can't really tie an emotion to a result. You know, I'm happy or I feel content and therefore we're going to drive profit margin. But we can say, you know, the belief that I want you to hold is that we put the team first and that's going to allow us to achieve X key result, you know, a certain EMPS score, for example. Or the belief I want you to hold is that we can standardize to scale, that standardizing is a is a powerful way for us to scale this business, and that's going to allow us to grow revenue by X percent. So when we're giving feedback, when we're recognizing our employees, when we're telling stories, we're always talking about examples of how this belief was manifested in action and how that will affect the key results so that we're constantly reminding everyone about every layer of that definition of culture, which we call the results pyramid. So I'm quite fascinated by what is going on probably at a societal level and it depends if you're on social media or not if you're not on social media you probably don't even know that what i'm going to say is a thing if you're on social media we're seeing a lot of the younger generation coming through where inverted commas their lived experience is very important And your vocabulary, which I totally buy into, and I can absolutely can see at a systemic level, let's not get caught up in language that is controlling us more than we're controlling it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's 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 really, really important. But there is a, a generation and that's not fair because there's a spectrum. And of course, you can't whitewash an entire group of people that happen to be born between a super a certain age. But actually that their emotional state and the way that they're reacting to what they think is making them happy and you know we saw a lot of that with people on twitter who were working for twitter going hey let me share my day at twitter <laughs> and it was i start with a cappuccino and i then i did yoga and it was all about the surroundings it was all about the ping pong tables <laughs> they were actually leading with look how awesome this is where actually yeah but that isn't actually giving you what the value of work should be giving you you're you're enjoying the experience of the environment more than the reality of maybe what we're talking about here and i and i just wonder if that's a if that's a truth that there is a difference in maybe some of the expectations that youth has that is being infected by a social media kind of marketing as opposed to the reality of turning up in in a business environment and if we do too many ping pong tables we end up laying off 10,000 people. Yeah I'm so glad you asked this because I literally wrote the book on it. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't even think you knew that. So in 2016 (laughs) I wrote a book called Unfairly Labeled, How Your Workplace Can Benefit from Ditching Generational Stereotypes. And it's based on my doctoral dissertation research, which was all about the millennials and the Gen Xers. And I mean, Gen Z wasn't even in the workforce back then, right? We're going on seven years ago now. I dug into the research because I was that millennial. I was given feedback in a performance review that I was just like, quote unquote, those millennials. I just needed to bake a little bit longer. And so I wanted to understand what in the world that meant. And when I did the research, what I found was 
99% of the stereotypes we associate with each generation were completely false, including the tech savviness, including the entitlement complex, including the mental health issues that were associated with younger people. So much, the loyalty to employers was complete nonsense. So much of what we think about millennials and baby boomers even, because every generation is stereotyped in their unique way, is not supported by the data. What it is, is it's ageism coming out in generational labels that are socially acceptable. And what you're seeing with this next generation, with Gen Z, is information being shared in a way that previously was not shared. So social media, what I've learned, it is merging culture and brand even more than it ever has been before. Because the internal culture that used to be private to the internal employees is now being broadcasted on social media platforms so that your brand is affected by the perception that your employees have of your culture. So brand used to be an external manifestation of your culture and culture the internal manifestation of brand. Now they're really one in the same, they're integrating. You're even seeing some organizations have the same person in both the CMO role and the CHRO role because they're feeling like those two things are so intertwined. I love that information is now being shared in this multi-directional, multi-dimensional way because it's keeping leaders honest. It's keeping, it's, it's not, it's, a, it's allowing for more transparency, you know, and the fact that some people are sharing about cappuccinos. I mean, I love a cappuccino. I love playing ping pong. There's not bad things. I would hesitate to say that's what this generation values. It may be that's what this generation is sharing because how do I create a social media post about I just had my performance review with my leader and they shared this feedback for me and it really made me think and now I'm going to adjust the way that I behave. That's what culture is in action and yet it's a lot harder to post, right? So it may just be a perception based on the nature of the way the content is coming at us. So generational labels exist and you you see them everywhere, you know, um, with descriptions of the differences. And the reason I raised the question and the reason I particularly, you know, when we connected and I saw what you'd written and what you're about, this really rang a bell with me. I probably just didn't have the exact vocabulary for it, which is, you know, why you're here to educate. And I did kind of get that sense of when we say that, this generation has expectations of the ability to have an opinion. Well, everybody probably probably got that opinion. They all want that. There's no human being that doesn't want that. What we might say is that society has moved on where it's more acceptable and more, um, not acceptable, it's more expected that I can verbalise an opinion. So is it that actually society is moving along with its expectations and there happens to be a generation having that experience is that it is an interesting sort of alignment to or actually is it a group of people that are generating that it's because of them this is happening or is it no older generations have also been pushing that it's just that this younger gen- this next generation gets to have the output of what others have been generating and expecting. So they they are now having that experience, but they didn't necessarily create it. It it comes from the foundational behaviors of those that went before. Yeah, I mean, how many baby boomers or traditionalists do you know that don't have iPhones? Society is evolving. We are changing. The employee voice is becoming more important than it was before. And it's not because a bunch of 18-year-olds said, I want to be able to be heard, right? That expectation exists in every generation, just like the technology use, for example, right? Millennials were the digital natives and baby boomers were the digital immigrants. And it was the young people who knew about technology and not the older people. Well, when you actually dig into using technology in the workplace, the rate of adoption of technology was the same for both generations. Now, What's true is at home, at night, millennials were more likely to have a cell phone next to their bed than a baby boomer, but that didn't mean that in the workplace, baby boomers were looking around saying, I'm not going to use the spreadsheet. I'm sticking with my paper, you know? And so the way we think about it needs, we need to be very nuanced in that because what ends up happening is we make assumptions about young people 
or old people or any people based on, well, you know, that's what that generation's like. And now I'm not actually seeing the person in front of me. I'm seeing a label and a stereotype that has been fed to me by what I believe to be true. And that's unconscious bias. That's what happens across age lines. That's what happens across race lines. That's what happens against gender lines. It happens across height lines, right? It's why more CEOs are males who are tall than males who are short. For some reason, we have an unconscious bias collectively that tall men are better leaders than short men. What's that about? It happens in the way people dress and the way in their weight. You see performance reviews for overweight people are generally lower than performance reviews for people who are fit. Why is that? It's because we have a perception about what that weight means about that person. And so that's what we need to combat is making sure we're seeing the person and giving them an experience that they are seen and heard because that makes everyone in every generation feel valued. So when you work with an organization, Jessica, what is it that tells you that it's a healthy organization in this context? What are the signs that you say, look, when I'm, we can, there's always, I can always dig deeper, but if, you know, in that first day or two of being inside an organization, those first primary conversations, you know, we've all got radars for things like when you walk into a restaurant, you go, oh no, this is not going to be good. You know, or oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> you know, you have that, the atmosphere, whatever it is. So what are those things that say to you, yeah, that's working well, or you might even say off of the red flags that would tell me, ah, Houston, we have a problem. Yeah, that's a great question. So alignment. When I'm asking, I do ask all of the leadership and various employees that are not in the leadership team the same question. And if I'm getting the same answers, then that is alignment. And that means that this organization is doing great. About half of our clients are organizations that have great culture, but now they have new goals and they need to up level or transform their culture in order to get these new goals. They're moving in a new direction or they're going to innovate in a way that they haven't before. And so they need to adjust culture accordingly. The other half are organizations who they have something wrong, something is broken, and they need to change culture just in order to get the results they're trying to achieve that they haven't been able to achieve. And in those, you often see, I'll ask the CEO, what are you trying to achieve this year? And you ask the CMO and the CHRO, and you ask a VP of product development, and then you ask an engineer on the team, and you get different answers from every person. We do research on this constantly. We have tons to publish we, we, that we have published that your, your listeners can get a copy of at the end of this. I'll give you a link. And we found that the number one driver of culture strength within organizations is clarity of results. If everyone knows what we're trying to achieve, then you're going to have a way better time at achieving a strong culture. That's the top of the pyramid that we've been talking about is what results are we trying to achieve? Then you can reverse engineer once you know your results. That's really strategy. The culture equation, which we do with our clients, is all about understanding your purpose, which is your why, tying it to strategy, which is the how, and then driving that, activating that with culture, which is the way that you get results. And so clarity of results is number one. And when people don't know what they're trying to achieve, that's always where we start. We start with strategy and why. So looking forward into the future, you know, the future of work, I, I guess, you know, you can read a book, you can go on a course, you can attend a seminar and you can get very evangelical or people can get very evangelical about what could be. And it's, you got to be, which is why some people say, oh, you know, be careful. They've been on a course because, you know, you come back and you know, something's really exciting and you want to push for it. But also things take time and people take time to adapt and to change. So if you look forward, you know, we, we had COVID, that didn't exist. You know, and you think, you know, over the next one to three years, is there, a, is there anything that actually, if organisations don't change or don't come to terms with it, it's going to bite them? Or actually, guy, no, it's not one to three years, it's one to 
it's one to ten years. It won't it won't be immediate. But if they if there's longevity required, then actually this is where they're going to fall down if they don't pay attention to it. So I'd be interested in the that sort of balance of there might be short term things that <clears throat> any organisation can do to improve itself. But actually, there might be long-term things, and if people don't pay attention to it, or maybe even in the short term, it could really trip them up. It'd be lovely to hear about that. Yeah, absolutely. So since 2008, the birth rate, the birth rate has dropped about 30%, and higher ed institutions are well aware of an enrollment cliff that is coming in 2025, where they're going to have about 15% less students than they typically have had. That enrollment cliff is going to become a workforce cliff a few years later. And we are running out of people. You already have seen the Great Resignation, which was a result of people taking stock of what they value, what's important to them during COVID. And many people have opted out of the workforce. You see women leaving the workforce in droves, largely due to childcare. 80% of single parents are women. And you are also seeing men, young men, leaving the workforce in droves right now, which is probably one of the more surprising statistics. But when we dig into why, it has to do with values alignment, that right now there is a sense in the air from employees that they feel like this system is broken, it's not working for them, that they're being taken advantage of. And that anti-work sentiment, which started as this radical fringe group, is now growing. You're seeing more and more on TikTok, more and more on Instagram and other social media platforms about people saying, this is not okay, I am fed up. And people will become more valuable as we continue to run out of people. We may have had a bunch of high-tech layoffs, but that was opportunistic of the CEOs, knowing that they weren't going to suffer severe brand reputation damage from those layoffs because all their peers were doing it. The actual jobs report and unemployment shows that there are still more job openings than there are people. And um, unemployment is at a low rate right now. So the story isn't, oh, you know, it's an employer's market. The story is it is an employee's market and it is going to continue to become even more so into the future. So it is time for organizations to think radically differently about the way that we treat employees in the workplace. And what has largely been driven by greed and corporate profits and shareholders needs to be driven by love. I mean, we need to bring love back into the workplace where we're, tr we're seeing people the way that they truly are. We're treating them with respect and dignity. We are not hiding information for, from them in fear that they might leave the organization and then somehow we won't meet a target. These are people we're talking about. And organizations in the future that really get that are going to be having a competitive advantage. This is the funny part. There will be a massive value proposition in treating people with love and coming from the heart in the way that we make business decisions rather than coming from the bottom line. We're doing research with Stanford right now that hasn't been released yet, but I can give you a little sneak peek into it, which is that organizations that were focused on the bottom line did and strategy, that was not a predictor of revenue growth. The organizations that were focused on culture, those were the organizations that had massive growth. So that's going to be the future of work. We need to change the paradigm, you know, and the norms, the, st the culture of work. The story we tell about who we are has to shift, and I think organizations that get that get that are going to be able to sustain into the future. So I just want to pick up on a couple of things, and it may be backtracking slightly, but just to pull that thread through, which is when we say organizations that focused on the culture have thrived, it's because of that alignment to, and now we say it's not necessarily focusing on the bottom line, but partly culture is then that absolute clarity on strategy that says this is our clarity these are our results this is what we're heading for so again the people when you say the people that focused on culture you don't mean the ping pong tables no i don't mean the ping pong tables i mean the people who focus on the levels underneath that action trap. You can have a really clear strategy and you can understand the actions that need to happen. But then if you get stuck in just those two things where you're thinking about what do people need to do different, what processes what do we need to improve, that is the trap that doesn't focus on culture, which happens beneath that, which is what do employees need to believe about what's important here? And 
what experiences can I give them so that they believe those things? It's tying culture to strategy. That is the culture equation. It's purpose plus strategy powered by culture gets results. Perfect. You also, we, we spoke about the, the great resignation and I do hear certain people go, I don't know if it's a real thing. I have heard other people go, yes, it is. So the question might be, well, where did they go then? Because I can, you know, if, if money still has to be earned and rent still has to be paid, is it that there's a generation of people that are of an age with the mortgages paid off that go, do you know what, I'm out? Is it that there are some of the youth that go, do you know what, I can stay at home for another seven or eight years because, you know what, it's just not a problem. I mean, if probably if you've got a mortgage to be paid, you've still got a mortgage to be paid. But is it is it the top and tail of that that are able to opt out? And or is it people going... I'm not going to opt out of working, but I don't know if I'm going to go to university and get a debt to come out with a degree that may not be as respected as it used to be, unless it's maybe pure maths or something along those lines. And actually, I'm going to work, but I'm just not going to work to work at that level. I'm going to be happy working here and I'm going to cut my cloth accordingly. So almost where did they go? What What is the thinking behind that? Because I think some people might just go, yeah, but it never really happened, did it? Because people have still got to work and pay the mortgage. So I, I, where, where have they gone and, and what is their thinking? I put, where did all the workers go in chat GPT the other day? Because I was like, where did they go? Okay. <laughs> chat GPT gave me a pretty boring answer. But I can tell you anecdotally, I mean, some of them died. Some of them became ineligible to work. That was COVID. That was part of it. I mean, it really was part of the story. But I can tell you some other stories that paint a picture of where they go, right? It's my friend Kate, who used to work at an academic institution. Her husband is a financial advisor. She was a career counselor. And childcare costs became so prohibitive that she just decided to stay home and they still pay their mortgage, but they're relying on the income from her husband only. And she's now out of the workforce and she's still paying the mortgage, right? It's my cousin, Max, who is a hippie in, you know, a modern day hippie who decided that he was anti-capitalist and he's choosing to live poor rather than to live in quote unquote the system, right? So he doesn't have a, a, a mortgage. He bought a van and he's traveling around and he's doing odd jobs here and there and then moving on. So there are alternative ways of living that emerge when people say, this isn't the right path for me. I want to leave. And that's why we've got for every job opening, no, for every person looking for a job, we've got 1.5 job openings because there are those that are no longer looking because they said, I'm going to live a different way. So the, these different people, are they seeing the workplace as, is the right word, toxic? Is it a social response just to work per se, regardless of how great it is? Or is it, no, it's not that. It's there's a level of expectation that cannot be found in an organization. It's not reasonable to ask that organization to be like that, but people that's what people want. Or no, it is people aren't asking for unreasonable. They just can't find reasonable. <laughs> Therefore, they're opting out. So, I, I, you know, so maybe do people see it as toxic? And if so, is is that is that fair to is that fair in their observations? I guess. Yeah, I mean. It, it depends, right? There's not a yes or no answer to that question. Some see it as toxic and they're opting out and others just have decided that something else will work for them. I've worked in toxic environments and my mental health suffered as a result of the experiences that I had there. And it led me to a belief that, you know, I had to leave, <laughs> frankly, and that led my, to my action, which is I quit and that got them a result, which is they lost that employee. The thing that's powerful about this model that we've been talking about is this is not like a great workplace tool. This is the way that humanity works. We as children, when we're growing up, have an experience, many, many experiences that develop beliefs. We have experiences with our family, with our community, with our church that leads us to beliefs about like, here's what's right, here's what's wrong, here's what's important. And those, ex those beliefs determine our actions, which I'm going to go to Yale or I'm going to go shoplift. And you're going to get a result from whichever actions you take. You're going to go to prison or you're going to get a high paying CEO job. And so we're constantly evolving our beliefs through the experiences that we have. And I think in COVID, I personally 
loved lockdown because it forced me to pause. I was running a million miles a minute pre-COVID, and it forced me to slow down, to spend time with my family, and to sit outside in the backyard and look up at the stars. And it was something that I hadn't been previously doing because I was sucked into hustle culture, you know, and productivity madness. And now I have a completely different way of working and showing up. And my organizational work is more meaningful than ever, but also my mental health is better than ever because I don't take any meetings until nine o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning because I have a two hour morning routine that I have to do in order to feel good about my day. And my workplace understands that and they welcome that because they know they'll get my best work if I'm able to take care of myself. Other organizations would not create that kind of an environment. And those are toxic, right? I mean, it's always, we have to put people before profitability. Otherwise, you're going to be successful for a shorter period of time. And then ultimately, it's going to fail at an organizational level. So really, there is, there's always a distribution curve, or there's always a spectrum uh, on these things. And actually, then, what I think I'm hearing is, you know, toxic can mean, you know, different things to different people. People can say words of violence and other people can know they're not. You know, it's all, there's a, there's a level of opinion here. But there is something then about it's damaging you. And not just the, and that could be going, a group of people are experienced being damaged, which is different to you as an individual. So you might find it toxic, but it doesn't necessarily mean it is. Or it could be, no, there's enough people having a bad experience that says this is a toxic culture. So there's, there's probably something uh, around that. But actually, even if the word toxic is too strong, there is just something about it's not working for you. Yeah. And, and it just, I actually want something. So maybe some people are responding to... I just want to operate at a different tempo. I, 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 my vibration just needs to be different. I don't want to do a two and a half hour journey into work and a two and a half hour journey back. So actually, it's not that I don't want to work hard, but I want to adjust and calibrate. So it may not have been toxic, but now that I've had this from home experience, holy schmoly, there's a much better way of doing this. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's, it's not always toxic, but it's just I've seen a better way. Maybe that's part of it as well. Yeah. And basic supply and demand economics, when there are less people, which we are getting less and less people and more jobs, the, 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 that which is scarce has the power, right? So employees are going to be able to opt out of being forced into the office. They're going to be able to opt out of having leaders who are treating them like cogs in a wheel. They're going to be able to opt out of those toxic environments, whatever they look like. So leaders need to step their game up if they're going to win the long term game. And there are some organizations where, you know, they say we want every single employee back into the workplace. Be, Disney. And, and I, <laughs> right. And, and I kind of, you know, there's an element of me that says, look, if you're of a certain age, whatever that might be, you probably don't need it as much. You've had the learning experiences. You've got a sense of what your job is. You've done the politic. You, you've learned from observing others. But there's also then that that first entry point into the workplace where not having people around not seeing the general cut and thrust of conversation maybe there is something missing so it must be very difficult for an organization to say now what we're missing is bringing talent through and it's not that it can't be done remotely but it's or maybe actually no we just have to adapt you know it can't the answer can't be just everybody back in so the young ones have got people around them that can learn <laughs> maybe actually no there must be a way of doing this but maybe we just haven't sorted it out yet. Yeah, I mean, why do we need to make sure that the young people how to know how to work the old way of working? You know, what's true is we need to adapt to the new way of working. And young people are going to... That's another reason that people are becoming more valuable is because now they are... Op they're able to work in organizations that are much more geographically dispersed. It used to be if you lived in... Twin Cities, you had to find a job in the Twin Cities, right? But now you have global organizations all over the place that you can apply for and work remotely in, which means the competition for talent is even more fierce. And so, yeah, the world is changing and organizations need to keep up. And these, you know, Bob Iger and these other CEOs that are forcing their employees into the office are using old school tactics, because it's what they know. It's the playbook that they have available to them. And there are many organizations, mine included, large Fortune 10 companies included, that have said, you know what? 
forget it. We're just going to work from home. We're going to save the real estate. We're early adopters of the new normal, and they have a head start on figuring out how to incorporate those young new employees into the culture virtually. That's very interesting, isn't it? We're prepared to have a little bit of a bumpy road to move to a place that actually is probably better for everybody as opposed to let's pull back to the old model because it gives us what we know. So it's the nature of change. Every single change has goes through that process, right? So this is no different. It's just another type of change. Yeah, and I do see when they force people back, it's 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 actually a demonstration of autocracy as opposed to a a demonstration of confidence. Yeah, I mean, so many of the rules and processes and regulations, everything from, um, you know, these monitoring software and one extreme, these leaders who are forcing people to keep their webcam on when they're working from home. I mean, that is really toxic, in my opinion, all the way down to just our travel policies. So much of HR is built around not trusting the employee, worried that the employee is going to take advantage of the company, right? And we need to shift our thinking in that way and create room for autonomy. That is what motivates people when they have freedom to work in the way that works for them. When we can embrace that kind, giving that autonomy to employees, we create room for creativity, which is, you know, that's what Bob Bob Iger is saying. Why he wants people back in the office at Disney is to improve creativity, to which I say, well, that's not a very creative way of going about nurturing creativity, Bob. I mean, that's the old way of doing it, right? So let's think different. That's, That's good, isn't it? You know? Let's, uh, yeah, uh, I want the fun to start at three o'clock. You know, it's that kind of autocratic kind of uh, control. So as we start to just, and and with everybody I have on this podcast, you know, I could, I could keep going for two weeks and eventually you'd say, guy, I have to go and live my life. So I'm just super alert to time. I think probably what I would like to, my final question might be, for somebody that's listening to a podcast like this, you know, they could be 18 starting out, they could be 55 thinking they've nailed it. But when they listen to this, what could they do differently? Or maybe maybe they do it, they, they, they reinforce it. If you're doing it, do more of it. But if you're not, start doing it. That from your point of view would make an, an impact to one or all of the topics that we've been talking about. Lead with love. I mean, that I think is the thing that we all need to do a little bit more. Leading with love means coming from the heart. You know, I mean, I was just talking about this with my CEO and I said, why is it that when these big tech companies have all these layoffs, it always happens like a surprise in the middle of the night, Slack access is removed. Then suddenly people wake up the next morning and they're unemployed. Why does it have to be such a shock? Why isn't it something that we can talk about beforehand? What if we had radical candor, radical transparency in the same way where we gave people a heads up? I was talking to the head of culture at IBM once, and he said, if people aren't safe in this organization, I want them to be able to get themselves to safety. And so he is transparent with his team and encourages transparency within IBM so that people know where they stand. It's a psychological safety so they don't get the rug pulled out from under them. That's something that we don't do because what if we tell people that we might be doing layoffs soon and they might be on the list and they might look for a job and go somewhere else and we might lose someone that we didn't want to lose. And so what? You know, at least you did the right thing. At least you led with love and created a sense of uh, valuing people above what numbers we put in a spreadsheet. So much of what's going on right now is just so irritating to me is, yeah, we grew in revenue. Yeah, we have billions of dollars in profit, but it wasn't as many billions as we thought we were going to have right now. And so because we didn't make as many billions as we thought we would make this particular quarter, we're going to have to lay off 5 to 10% of our workforce. I mean, that's insanity. It's true insanity. you know. And the reality is it also doesn't work. Here's research out of Harvard Business Review that studied 5,000 companies that navigated through the last three recessions. And they said there's three basic reactions. There's cut costs, cut people. 
there's do nothing. And then there's invest heavily in R&D and buying, you know, other organizations that are you're getting a screaming deal for. So there's cut, there's do nothing, and there's invest heavily. The top 9% of companies that were thriving three years post-recession were the ones that did nothing. Is reacting with calm, with a sense of equanimity. It's not reacting with that action trap mentality, which is really fear-based, but reacting with love and saying, we got this. Recessions last 11 to 15 months. We're just going to wait it out. There is actually a huge cost associated with layoffs, including the severance that you're paying for people not working, the rehiring and retraining that happens a year later, and the fact all of the missed opportunity that that, those employees could have done. So, so much is backwards right now. And if we infuse more love into the workplace, people would see that. Okay. Thank you. So lay out where people can connect with you and or where they can go to see things. You mentioned one of the websites uh, be, without giving the address, but I'll, I'll obviously I'll put it in the description as well, but it'd be great for people to hear that because I think some of them will be uh, excited and looking forward to going and having a look. Yeah, absolutely. We have research and toolkits and just constantly pushing out content that is useful to leaders interested in culture. You can go to podcast dot culture dot io to get access to that and reach out to me i'm on linkedin mostly and if you reach out to me i'd be happy to connect and i will put that in there as well so listen i'm going to get you to hold on just for a few moments to make sure everything's loaded and uh, other than that though i'm going to say thank you you've got a a, a certainty and a, and a succinctness and a clarity that really shines through so and that's not always the case sometimes i do these podcasts and it's a little bit tricky getting people to volunteer their thoughts perhaps or even maybe actually you know what have they have they actually thought it through and you clearly have so that's educational and it's exciting for me so i absolutely love it so thank you from me and thank you on behalf of everybody that's listening thank you for having me it was a pleasure